Books Love Me. The name of the library is Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, the Library of Hermetic Philosophy. This library with the rare books and uh, manuscripts, altogether some 23,000 volumes. The possibilities that I had to buy books was always combined with the task to produce every day a result as an entrepreneur. So I built a company uh, and I made out of the, the profits of my company. But it is not so that the books come like birds into the house of treasures of, of Mr. Ritman. No, you have to make an effort to acquire them. I built a library, I, I bought books, I brought them together. The books, they are on the shelves. You have to open the information. Suddenly, you come to the point that you are not standing alone any longer. And that is the fantastic point, what I call the chain of initiates. We are invited to be members. That's what I love most in this library, to see that in every single book, in a different way, and a book doesn't stand alone, they stand together. They are like in a continuous conversation with each other, and that's what fascinates me. By Western esotericism, we mean a set of currents, of movements, of authors that can go back basically to late antiquity and then through the Middle Ages with a big revival in the early modern period during the Renaissance and then which continue during the Enlightenment and also throughout uh, the 19th and 20th century, basically up to our days. Western esotericism is a study from the outside to the inner reality. You can call that occult streams, you can call that esoteric streams, you can, ha can call that hermetic streams. It is like to dive into all the different aspects of a tradition. Traditions that emerged and developed mostly in Europe and in the Mediterranean basin. To compose an alphabet of understanding but it never gives the meaning of the language itself. Approaching the divine, approaching kind of metaphysical reality, are precisely what we can understand as the core of esotericism. I was very interested in the human presence, but not as the end of the story, but the beginning of the story. Uh, where I say, what is the man? Why is he here? He comes from the invisible, he lives here, and he disappears. If you look into the Hubble telescope, you can see this infinite universe, and you see all different forms of energy that are, in a way, on the move. Perhaps we did not know but we are experiencing a Big Bang again. We say you have the elements earth, water, air and fire. But I believe for myself that there is a new element in the atmosphere. New element in the atmosphere. That, that what was invisible and came to the mystery schools and under the protection of ceremonies, where there is a holy of holiness, there this divine energy was kept as a secret. I think that divine energy is now available for billions, millions of persons. And that is the so-called individualism. Why, as they don't refer any longer, not, not a second longer, with the old tradition, with the old generation, with the way you think, you live, you are. The domination of the past is broken. It all ends in anarchy. And, and, and that, that you see in this moment, in the international power fields, conflicts, uh, that we are in a crisis. 
Nobody can say, I have nothing to do with that. It comes closer and closer. We are not independent. We are very dependent, more and more dependent to each other as we thought in the past. We have main collecting areas and they are Hermetica, Alchemy, Mysticism, Rosicrucianism, but related collecting areas are Kabbalah, but also Theosophy, Anthroposophy, so the more modern movements originating from the 19th century can also be found here. Esotericism is in fact a modern word because it was created in the 19th century, but in fact the history of the term is older. The word comes from the Greek, the ancient Greek esoterikos, which is an adjective, which basically means interior, it means something that is inner, so something that is inside, as opposed to something that is outside. And in ancient Greece, the term was used especially to refer to philosophy, to philosophical schools. For instance, in the case of Plato, in the case of Aristotle, the idea was that there was a particular teaching that was meant for a broader public, and then there was a more restricted kind of teaching, and that teaching would be reserved only for a particular elite. So you really needed to be a pupil. That's Hermes Trismegistus. That's called Phileus Noster. And here you see the sun, the moon, and coming together brings forward Hermes Trismegistus. He is having, the Caduceus, and that is the, the symbol of initiate, the Mercure, the Clope, and the attribute of power. The texts of Hermes Trismegistus are written down already in the pyramid of Saqqara in Egypt. We have an exhibition on Hermes Trismegistus and the visual imagery connected with Hermes a very colourful exhibition that shows you the roots of Hermes Trismegistus. He is part Egyptian, part Greek. He is the Egyptian god Toth and the Greek Hermes, and these two combined were Hermes Trismegistus. This is a beautiful image of Hermes Trismegistus. It's a reproduction from a mosaic in Siena. He is a wisdom teacher, a sage who presents to the Egyptians the laws and the letters. Originally, the distinction perhaps did not have much to do with spirituality. Later on, this idea was connected to the ancient mystery cults, like Dionysism or the mysteries of Eleusis, and therefore a more spiritual meaning was attached to the word. And it was thought that in fact an esoteric teaching had to do with something that was religious, something that was spiritual. So it had to do, for instance, with the destiny of man after death. That is basically the origin of the modern concept of esotericism. This is one of the most important books in our library, a book by Hermes Trismegistus, the name giver of the library, of course, Hermes. And we collect all the editions of his philosophical works. We call it now the Corpus Hermeticum, in the older days, it was called Pimander, after the pupil that is instructed by the philosopher Hermes. The Egyptian god Toth and the Greek Hermes, they are both scribes, messengers, and magic is also attributed to the two of them. And that is why they were conflated and became Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest. Classical culture becomes less prominent during the Middle Ages. Greek culture was sort of forgotten, but then it comes back in the Renaissance. One of the treasures of the library, and that is the, the Corpus Hermeticum of Hermes Trismegistus, on vellum. At the end of the Middle Ages, with the conquest of Constantinople, there is the rediscovery of the Neoplatonic texts, some texts by Plato, so the rediscovery of Platonic philosophy. 
but also the rediscovery of the Hermetic texts, which played uh, really a key role in the revival of what we call esoteric ideas, especially in Italy, in Florence, more particularly the Cosimo de' Medici and then Lorenzo il Magnifico, of course, uh, with scholars such as uh, Marsilio Ficino, Pico della Mirandola. It all starts in Italy, but then it spread all around Europe. I was in the Medici Library in Florence. It was built by Michelangelo. And there was an exhibition to commemorate the 500 years death of Marsilio Ficino, the, the director of the Medici Library. She said to me, Mr. Ritman, I have a present for you, but you can, you don't can take it away. She gave me in my hands. And that was the original copy of the manuscript of the Corpus Medicum. Cosimo de Medici gave order to Marsilio Ficino to translate the text of the Corpus Medicum. And then it was printed, and you see it there in an original publication on parchment. There's also a very, very interesting story when we did an exhibition on the text uh, tradition of the Corpus Medicum. We had a Dutch translation in manuscript of the Corpus Medicum, but one half of the book was missing. In that period, I still lived at home, and at a certain evening, some, something was put in our postbox, and it was a booklet, and it said with a small note, Mr. Ritman, I think you should have this in the library. And that was so amazing, because it was the missing part of that same particular book that was reunited in this way. And these are moments you cannot, you cannot even imagine to happen, and it has all happened in the past 30 years. We're talking about Hermes Trismegistus, and another attribute is the robberous, cyclical serpent biting its own tail. And to end with the staff of Hermes, and there's a beautiful picture at the end, an engraving, which captures all three. You have the Greek Hermes on top. In the middle, it's the hieroglyphs, the Egyptian Toth. And here you have Hermes Trismegistus in oriental garb, the wise sage, the wisdom teacher. So all three are here combined in this engraving from the late 18th century. This is one of the later editions of the Corpus Hermeticum, a scholarly edition in Latin. In other languages, such as Italian, Dutch, English, there are also editions of the Corpus Hermeticum. All the books were very often rebound, and not only once, but maybe four or five times. And every time a new binding was put around the book, the binder cut the paper nice and sharp, but we lose a bit of text then. This is the first time the texts of Hermes were translated into German. And as you can see, that was rather late. It's 1706. Of course, everybody could read Latin in those days, so they kept printing the Latin edition. An illustration like this, of course, has to do with the book. It refers to the emerald table, also uh, a text ascribed to Hermes, and it says, so above, so below. The macrocosmos, the, the world above the world of the gods, and the microcosmos, the world of man. This Corpus Hermeticum is also having the tabula smaragdina, this is a beautiful engraving from the early 17th century called the Tabula Smaragdina, and one of the most pregnant phrases from this very brief text, Emerald Tablet of Hermes, is that which is above is like that which is below, and it, it just tells you all about the intimate connection between the macrocosm and the microcosm. In this period of time, many persons are coming to an idea that there is something hidden behind the curtain of visible life. A hidden meaning that has to be found, 
a hidden meaning that has been handed down in the form of a tradition, or a hidden meaning that can be discovered through particular experiences of revelation, of contact with the divine uh, dimension, with God, or also with nature, for instance, a mystical experience of fusion with nature. Let's climb the mountain. Let's try to reach the top. Or and let's go deep in the earth. But what you find out at the end of the story, you only find at a certain moment some persons who climb to the top. Some persons who dive so deep in the mystery. This hidden meaning can be found in different ways, in different places. It can be found in a text, for instance, uh, the Bible, but also all other sacred texts. Uh, it can also be found uh, in the Quran, if we think about Islam. But it can also be found in nature, an idea that has been widespread since the Middle Ages. God is speaking to us not only through uh, the textual revelation of the Bible, but also uh, through nature. When uh, we have a contact with the natural realm, we can read symbols, we can read signs, and through a particular hermeneutical ability, which is the ability to interpret these signs and these symbols, we can understand the hidden message. So we can understand what God is trying to tell us. So the only thing is to open the curtain. And then you come in a landscape of inner reality. But that will not say that you reach your goal. The man who climbed to the top and the man who was diving into the water and to find that hermetic pearl, the fantastic thing is that he brought it in a visible frame that everybody could touch it, could touch it the way the, the experience, that everybody could receive that experience. And that is so, uh, so I would say, so mysterious. Gradually, Hermes Trismegistus becomes really associated with alchemy, and he becomes the father of all philosophers, and the practitioners of alchemy become known as the sons of Hermes, Philii Hermetis. So there's a very close bond between Hermes and uh, alchemy. In this library, on these shelves, you find alchemy, you find Hermetica, and the two are very much related. Hermes is, so to speak, the patron saint of uh, alchemy. In the 16th and 17th centuries, people who performed alchemy, alchemists, were known as the sons of Hermes. So there is a very close connection between alchemy and Hermes. You don't find many alchemical symbols painted. This is one of the great moments also in my interest as an art collector. It shows the triumph of alchemy, a triumphal chariot with... Basil Valentine. As it has never been reproduced and never been looked at by scholars, this little painting is probably unique in the history of alchemical imagery. A lady who is uh, the negative side of alchemy tries to attract, I would say, the pseudo-alchemists. All the real adepts were taking the, the secret of the keys of Basil Valentine to the real process of alchemy. I only recognized it because I was looking in an old book and there it was redrawn, and I thought, I recognize this drawing. This is the picture that Mr. Edmund has hanging on his wall for 20 years. And then I took a closer look and found out what an extremely rare piece we have here. For me, the imagery of the library is so interesting because the symbolic 
engravings and drawings that you will find in uh, many books of this library, they contain the same elements, yeah, like uh, the circle and the square and the triangle. And their meaning is in fact universal, but there is endless way that these symbols can be applied, whether in the work of a Christian Kabbalist or in the works of a mystic like Jacob Boehmer or a Christian hermetic thinker as Robert Flatt. I was always very curious. I was never satisfied with explanations. I said to myself, let me go and look to the reality of things. And therefore, I knew that I was a spark between the invisible life as a spark and then disappear again. Mr. Ritman disappeared. So I asked myself, when I am only a spark, a light flash in a moment, why I should not built a library, a library of awareness, of research. I started this library with the hermetic science. The hermetic science is a science of all awareness. I am convinced with the hermetic tradition to come into contact with, not only with people, but also with religions, with mystery schools, with initiates. And for me, the mystery schools around the world, they connected the master plan with the flow of human awareness through, I would say, the millenniums. This millennium is a completely different paradigma of references that what we saw so far in the last 5,000 years, different developments of religion, different developments of spirituality. But now it comes together in one global goal, and that's for me Gnosis. Gnosis. Hermetism and Gnosticism, they have the same roots in all the stories in all the religions of the world, it has to do with, I don't want to call it God, but I want to call it creator, creation, and creature, man. The three aspects of, I would say, the divine, the element of nature, the two elements of nature, the male and the female, comes together in a microcosm. Gnosis is the third component of our European cultural heritage, and that's what we have here in the library. Gnosticism, they speak about light, and darkness. The point in Hermitism is that they don't reject the Gnostic approach of life, but they say it is the task of a human being through experience, through daily experience in your life, where you meet positive and negative influences to come to the point that they are always going together, that they have a meaning. If we don't see that this library has a meaning, if we don't see that the last 12,000 years are also a reflection of the waves of life, if we don't see that, eh, then we don't come to a point of concentration. And so this library is a point of concentration. Of all the books in the Ritman Library, I love the Hermetic books most because to me, this Hermetic worldview, the relation between God, Cosmos, Man, is the essence of human consciousness 
That's the universal aspect in all religious and philosophical traditions. And what's most important, it's about the human being, him or herself. It's about us. It's about you. It's about me. What in the Hermetic tradition is said, when you want to know God, know yourself, study nature, and you will know God. The only reason that everything is not okay is that we lack knowledge. Knowledge of a dimension that we don't bring into our daily practice. The Gnosis is ours. It is an energy field. What we don't use together, that is the misuse of this period, that we are only living, that we are consumers, but that we are now soul beings. Kabbalah, Jewish forms of mysticism and esotericism, begin in the late Middle Ages, especially in the south of France, and also in those areas that were kind of crossroad uh, between Islamic, Christian, and Jewish culture, especially in Spain. Some authors in this period construct a whole system of occult philosophy, which is a kind of a synthesis effect. Harry Cornelius Agrippa, for instance, writes a famous work called the Occulta Philosophia, where he tries to bring together all these ideas. So uh, Christian Kabbalah, uh, magic, astrology, alchemy, they're trying to make a kind of consistent uh, vision of the world based on this occult wisdom. Occultists were opposing some of what they perceived to be kind of negative aspects of both science and religion. Uh, in terms of science, the biggest problem was, of course, materialism. The idea that the universe is constructed only on the basis of matter, that there is no space for spirituality, for the spiritual aspects of reality. When it came to religion, the biggest problems that was felt was seen in the presence of dogmatism. The idea that, in fact, established churches had sort of become petrified in their message, so they had lost some of the living spirit that was there when they had been uh, created, when they had been founded. I don't want to say that I have nothing with magic uh, and uh, that I have nothing with the occult. They are very important magicians. But for me, that's not enough. It was not so important to look at myself, but to look to nature, to look to the, the cosmos as a fantastic development of life waves and to see the universe as an infinite laboratory. A little bit later, in the German speaking, there are other currents that are emerging with Paracelsus, who is starting off what could be considered a different kind of tradition, a different kind of trend, which later will take the form of Christian theosophy, especially after Jakob Böhme. The great names of alchemy and medicine is, of course, Paracelsus, who was born in Switzerland and who was known as Trismegistus Germanus, the German Hermes, because he really believed in that Christian hermetic world picture and also believed that you could use minerals to cure people, to heal and perfect nature.
This is one of our books in the original binding, dated uh, 1512, The Letters of St. Paul. This is a text of the Bible. A Bible text is not a heretic text, of course, but in the commentaries we find these pasted in pieces of paper. That makes it very interesting because old printed books, two copies are never the same. That is very well illustrated. As you can see, one copy is a paper copy and this is a copy printed on vellum, on parchment. All over the commentaries, this text is censured. If we look at the same page in this copy, we will find no censored passages. So it depends where the book was used, if uh, certain ideas were thought to be heretic or not. But the general point is that many of our authors got into problems with the church. Men who were, who were crucified, were, were killed, uh, were brought to the stake, where they represented an inner reality and that they said no, no, no to dictatorship, that you have to obey. Giordano Bruno he is one of the, for me, the main philosophers of the 16th century. He was burned at the stake in the year 1600 by an accusation of heresy by the Catholic Church. But there was one book that brought him to the stake, and that was this text, Spaccio della Bestia Triumphante. In a way, it was a dialogue to break the walls of the scholastic approach of the Church, that the earth is in the center of the universe, but he said, no, the, the universe is infinite, so there is no center. There is no center in the universe. In our library, we have about 20 publications, first editions by Giordano Bruno, but this book was missing. I was in Venice, and I was there with a uh, conference, Safe Venice. Safe Venice, the water flood of Venice. And I was there with uh, many uh, international visitors, but in a special forum, people that were interested in books. And the last evening, there was an antiquarian bookseller who brought uh, some books about architecture in, in Venice. And suddenly it came with me to my mind to ask, do you have copies of Giordano Bruno? And he said, yes, Mr. Ritman, I have two. I have the Umbris Idearum and I have the Spaccio della Bestia Triumphante. And it was so nice that Bruno was taken prisoner in Venice. I felt myself very close to Giordano Bruno and then to acquire a book in the city where he was taken prisoner was very moving for me. And in Rome was the commemoration of 400 years death of Giordano Bruno. Me was given a compliment by the Minister of Culture to bring treasures also to Rome of Giordano Bruno. He was burned at the stake at the flower market in Rome, Campo di Fiori. And now you are here in the canal of the flowers in Amsterdam. My relationship with Giordano Bruno is very close. I created a foundation. I want to bring all these different opinions offering all these different experiences together. This library is a library of information about the inner network of the human search 
for the destiny of life. The new energy, you can call it Aquarius, or heavenly water, that comes to the earth and will, will clean up many, 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 many dark things or things that are crystallized, etc. Life is always on the move, like a river that floats through a landscape, but it brings energy, it brings the mineral life, vegetable life, the biological life. The meaning of something that is inside, something that is interior, remained, of course, and is still present today. And in fact, most people, when they are using the term esotericism, are probably using it precisely with this meaning. So referring to a religious message that goes beyond what is visible in uh, the literal form of a sacred text, for instance. You could see that there is a story in the Bible and you could wonder whether the story that is being told is the only message that is there. And ask yourself whether perhaps there is a kind of hidden meaning, a hidden story. The Polyclot Bible it was printed in Antwerp in 1573. It's a Catholic Bible, the so-called polyglot edition of the Bible. That means that all the languages in which the Bible manuscripts were originally found are reproduced here together. Hebraic, Chaldaic, Greek and Latin, so four languages. It is an example of book illumination of the highest quality that you can find in the world. All the illustrations are hand-colored. When the book left the press, the illustrations were just black and white. I love rare books, old books, because the paper is still as if it was produced yesterday. It's paper that is made by hand, but this old paper that will last for ages. That makes me happy. On the one hand, it was thought that it was possible to demonstrate the existence of a spiritual dimension. And on the other hand, many esotericists thought that it was possible to revive a kind of religious spirit by applying a different way of reading the ancient texts, a sort of metaphorical reading, an emblematic reading of the texts. In the 19th century, I think also actually in theosophy, was a very pregnant symbol. The Renaissance, of course, was a, a time of great open-mindedness and intense curiosity about other religions, about what um, moved other people. And this is a wonderful image, actually in a manuscript of 1575, and it shows the Sfirot, known as the Ten Divine Attributes. In Hebrew Kabbalah, you have Keter, Chochmah, Bina, down to Malchut, and these are the channels through which God can communicate with us. 
as above, so below. That's the hermetic phrase par excellence. So we have these volvel, these rotating wheels, that you could rotate, and each volvel has the same number of svirot, the ten, written on them, and they were used to meditate upon. Alchemy is the book of nature. Alchemy really is an exciting subject, fascinating, and it continues to fascinate uh, today. My fascination for alchemy is that it is a process of change. Alchemy, it's fascinating because it's to do with laboratory work, but it's also to do with discovering nature and finding out about the secrets of nature. And it was believed that God had implanted in nature these secrets for us, for man, to discover, to find out, and also to perfect nature. And this is also very nice. Was hell van fakkelen licht oh de brille, zo die lloyd niet zeeën wollen. I have a principle. That I say that the divine spark is within you. That the divine spark has to become a flame, a flame of awareness. And what that flame should produce is fire. Fire. And that fire is your. Heritage. So, spark, flame, fire. And that fire, that produces this fifth element. What the people at CERN are doing now is what the scientists, the alchemists in the 17th century were doing also. They were working in the laboratory and they were exploring nature. You see an interior of an alchemist. To pray, the oratorium, and, and to work, the laboratorium. And that is from Kuhnrad. Heinrich Kuhnrad, a German alchemist, physician also, is another very well-known engraving called the Laboratory and the Oratory. And here you have Kuhnrad himself, he's meditating, he's freeing his mind before he can perform the alchemical work in the laboratory. So you have the two, the oratory and the laboratory, actually on the same level. There is no hierarchy that performing alchemy and praying to God are on the same level. That's a really very astute observation. I was always interested in the laboratory of nature, the laboratory of the universe and the laboratory of the man as a microcosm. It's that sort of connection that's really fascinating, that between the work in the laboratory and the bigger picture, the idea of man as a microcosm who by exploring nature can discover the secrets that God implanted in nature for the perfection of mankind. So many esotericists at the time thought that esotericism could uh, give an answer uh, to that problem and could solve the conflict that existed between science and religion. So by constructing a kind of uh, common ground, a common field, like a bridge between the two. This is the Atalanta Fugens of Michael Meyer, with 50 illustrations, and it has to do 
is tekst, is music en emblems. Zo, het is een emblematic boek. En het is de main work of Michael Meyer. That brings me to the story in Paris. Uh, with my private plane, I flew to Paris. Then I met an uh, antiquarian uh, book dealer of Amsterdam. He wanted to take possession of the books and to sell them to me afterwards. Then he came to me, he said, uh, Joost, can we speak together? And I said, no, I come here for a special reason, to buy books. So there is for me no need to, to speak. We will meet in auction. There are some major auctions and there you have to fight. You have to be prepared uh, that you have to pay the price and you never know the price. They spoke about the night of the alchemist. People who came there together to, to get the recipe for cult making. So the people who are interested in the original writings were coming together and were fighting <laughs> in the second half of the last century. Many very rare books and manuscripts came to the book market. And now that period is over. So you can really say that I took the opportunity from the early 60s and now more than 50 years later to make this library complete. I bought at that auction one third of all the available text. This is a priceless book. And the mystery of alchemy here yeah. is a farmer. He is giving the seed to the land. But these are not normal seeds, that are cult seeds. The real alchemist brings the seed of cult making to the earth. There is a seed, and you have to put that in the inner center of your awareness, that seed. And at that moment that you have went through the experience, you see that that seed starts to grow and to flourish in a different dimension. And here is a circle, and then a square, and then a triangle. And out of the circle, the square and the triangle compose a man and a woman. And there you have the two elements in alchemy. The male and the female come together to create the stone of the vices. The library is a daily journal of 5,000 years human research into the field of spirituality and into the field of the unexpected. Alchemy, 
they speak about the three principles. About sulfur, that is related to the sun. Mercury, that's related to the moon. And salt is related to matter. The engravings that they contain have been produced in the same house. It was the engraver Merian who was working in Oppenheim. Atalanta Fugiens, that's in fact a multimedia booklet, I would say, that makes alchemy interesting to a broader audience. There have also been moments, for example, very beautiful hand-colored edition of the Atalanta Fugiens was offered to him and a colleague and friend of his said, okay, Joost, you have so much, please let me buy this one. And he's still sorry that at that moment he didn't go for it. Mysticism is the book of the knowledge of the heart. The knowledge of the heart goes deeper as the awareness of the eyes. Also Christian theosophy is very important, uh, which has its roots uh, in the 17th century already, and even earlier with uh, Paracelsus, and then later with Jacob Böhme. And for me, the most precious book in mysticism it's the aurora of Jacob Böhme. In the case of Jacob Böhme, it's a mystic experience. This is the aurora, a new momentum, an aurora for the awareness of humanity. And Jacob Böhme was not a learned person. He had a vision. He had a visionary mind and he felt he should write about it. This new moment that has come, the planet Earth, here you see uh, the zodiac, and here suddenly a completely new element is coming. If you see an image like this in the favorite book of my father, you're not immediately able to explain. You are able to grasp the meaning so somehow. It gives you some sensation of, wow, this is really special. The root or mother of philosophy, astrology and theology. So this is also a fantastic present and I could say that was uh, the spark that became a flame in my collector's life. That was the present when I was uh, 23 years old, it's now more than uh, 50 years ago, that I got from my mother. And this is one of the early copies uh, of the library. And so one if you call now what are now the first momentums, the first books, so you can say this, perhaps this was the first book that came to the collection. I do discoveries all the time. If you look at this booklet by Johan Gichtel, a follower of Jacob Böhme, it's a short introduction about the three principles and the world within man. He's talking about worlds in man. So there is a world of darkness inside us. The fascination that I personally have always had is the fascination for the imagery of the library. 
Of course, I've grown up in the world of ideas. A lot of the content of these books is visionary. So what's happening, the complete works of Jacob Bohme have been translated and put into print. And what you see, that there is again an artist who feels compelled to visualize. Here is our sun and here is the moon and here is the earth. So there you have already a macrocosmic reality. The abstract world of the macrocosm and the way the macrocosm uh, the divine world unfolds itself and becomes visible in the cosmos. This is Jacob Bohme's explanation of the human being, the androgenic human being. The human being has many instruments to understand his place in creation. He uses his senses, he uses his reason, and he has even got an astral mind. So he's able to understand abstract principles. Our eyes open up and then we see what's there. This is the symbol for the Holy Trinity with the fiat in the end and also probably in the beginning, Jehovah. That's the book of wonders. Wonderboek, Wonderboek. Sophia, the mother of wisdom. And here you see that she conquered the snake. At the beginning of the 17th century, we have the outbreak of the 30-year war, which is going to change, really, Europe, which is going to have very serious consequences politically and historically. In the historical climate, right before the outbreak of this war, that Rosicrucianism begins. It started with my father just knocking on the door of Aquarian bookseller, asking, I want to buy the Fama Fraternitatis and he started to laugh and said, okay, I'm looking for that all my life as well, so what do you think? It's a German affair, so to speak, because it uh, originated in Tübingen in 1614, where the first Rosicrucian Manifesto was written, actually, uh, Fama Fraternitatis, the call of the Brotherhood, and it was a very small pamphlet which called on all the learned heads of Europe to achieve a reformation, a worldwide reformation of science, religion, and really of everything, and making man realize he is the microcosm. The human being as a microcosm is in fact their medicine to a society that has lost its religious orientation. Rosicrucianism is in a way a chain of representatives who saw the contact between the heart, the mind and nature. The Rosicrucians were followers of Paracelsus. Paracelsus is actually one of the only people in the Fama Fraternitatis who is mentioned by name. The people behind the Fama Fraternitatis were dedicated physicians, they were Paracelsians and they produced this pamphlet to inspire people to bring about a real reformation. The manifestos are only three books, some hundreds of pages. The Fama Fraternitatis in that sense is also a very ethical little pamphlet. It was followed by the Confessio Fraternitatis and the Chemische Hochzeit. And these three pamphlets together 
are called the Rosicrucian Manifestos and they are really the source of um, a great furor in German society on the eve of the Thirty Years' War. In the very first lines of Fama Fraternitatis it is said, now after all we have learned and all gifts and grace that God has bestowed on us, it's now time to understand why we are a microcosm. But it's a wonderful story that of Christian Rosenkreutz, who travels to the Orient, who collects all kinds of magical, alchemical, Kabbalistic knowledge, takes it with him back to Europe and presents it to the learned heads of Europe who don't want to know. There are traditions related to alchemy, to astrology, and also very much uh, to magic that are still present in the Middle Ages and that are being kept alive in the territories uh, that are controlled by the Arabs. On his journeys, Christian Rosenkreutz, the protagonist of the Fama Fraternitatis, also visited Fez, a city in Morocco, and it's been established recently that the rules of the Brotherhood, four of them, are actually based on those of a Sufi community in Fez. So it's really remarkable that it's uh, presented as a magical tale, almost, but of course, like magic, it also has its roots in reality. And so what the Fama Fraternitatis urged was a reformation. Also, because they were Paracelsians and therefore physicians, they also urged their colleagues to cure people for free. The Arabs played a key role in transmitting the Greek culture by translating philosophical treatises into Arabic and then from Arabic into Latin. But if you look to the tradition of Rauskrucianism, there are hundred thousands of persons who are interested to know about Rauskrucianism. This is a watercolor drawing. It's the original illustration in the book of Manly P. Hall, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And what we see here is a very important moment in the Fama Fraternitatis, where one of the brothers who is architect he wants to improve something in the building and he sees a small nail in the wall and he thinks I should tear that out and when he does he finds a door and when they carefully take everything away and open the door they find the grave of Christian Rosenkreutz the founder of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood their father brother as they call him and on his grave they find a copper plate this Minitus Mundi all the knowledge and the secret of the Rosicrucians. The man, he is a minitum mundi, a little world, a microcosm, to come to the question, what is the reason behind that? During my lifetime, I have made the entire compendium of all this knowledge to my grave. That's a very mysterious sentence. But the meaning of the manifestos is always the same secret, that it has to do with the triangle of creativity, you can call that art, research, uh, you can call that science, but then within an visible framework of reality and then religion and religion is only the task to bring things together within one scope. We focused on the imagery of books around the Rosicrucians, of people who were not Rosicrucians, they were advocating their ideas. Robert Flatt claimed that he has written his encyclopedic works, Utriosca Cosmi Majoris, the physical, metaphysical and hyperphysical world, without having any notice of the Rosicrucian manifestos. Still, in all he's telling, he's giving this same key of the microcosmic man. And the microcosm has, for me, the promise if you go to this, through the process of experience, 
you can be in a direct connection with the creator. And with that, you become a co-creator. And that is for me the message of my library. I'm only a co-creator. We can produce nectar like a bee to uh, behave. And that, that nectar is the food for, I would say, human awareness. A beautiful engraving of Robert Flood, also made by Miriam, of the human mind. Man has an inner awareness connected to the world of the senses, to the world of the imagination, to the divine reality, and there's also the world of memory. A perfect man is aware that life in itself is not something that you can put like an, an, a picture or painting within a frame. There is no frame for life. There is no limit to human existence. There's one element that connects all these worlds, and that's the human soul. All the impressions that we obtain through our senses also give us an image, a sensation. We can connect all we see and smell to our imagination. But our imagination is also, again, a tool of the soul. Because when we imagine us to be a bird, as it is said in the Corpus Hermeticum, we are already there, high in the sky. And the human being is, with his imagination, can ha grasp some meaning of being a, of the divine world. And that's what is shown here. So with our ratio, our intellect and our spirit, we can enter the divine world. He says also the divine world is in constant interaction with the whole world, but also with the human mind. So it works both ways. Michal Spacher was also aware of the manifestos and in contact with people in this circle. This has also been designed by Miriam. They follow the tradition of human research. So Hermitism goes back to 5,000 years ago. Alchemy goes back to 3,000 years ago. The mysticism uh, is very related to Christianity. To put Christ in the center, uh, you can also mention Kabbalah, the Jewish tradition is also very important. But Rosicrucianism combines all these different flows, they are the fruit of, I would say, 5,000 years spiritual exploration of the human mind. Daniel Meuklin wrote a book that's called The Wisdom Mirror of the Rosicrucians. And then he writes in his text, you know about this mysterious brotherhood of the Rosicross that everybody is asking for. If you want to know what's the meaning of this Rosicrucian message, study this engraving closely. All you need to know about the Rosicrucians is there. I cannot say more. Because you know what happens when you say something, they are twisting your words. So I cannot say more. But one thing, once you understand why man is called a microcosm, you will encounter a Rosicrucian, maybe in your direct neighborhood. So what he is saying there, that the imagery he uses, it's a tool that's more accurate and pure than any words he could express in his book. This is a copy of the Geheime Figuren. It was printed in the late 18th century, but it returns to the sources of the 16th and 17th centuries. It's an image of the heavenly and terrestrial Eva, the mother of all creatures in heaven and on earth. 
Lady Sophia or the Virgin Sophia from her wisdom the divine comes into manifestation because of our consciousness because we become aware of the connection between the divine and the cosmos and the human being as the creature. This, for instance, is a beautiful image from Daniel Mögling's Speculum Rhodostaroticum, the mirror of the Rosicrucians, and it, it's called Poculum Pansophiae, the cup of wisdom. A man, and he's connected with mineral, vegetable, and biological life, so the microcosmos, and nature itself. The human being connects eternity and time. The human being is again displayed as an instrument, an instrument of the divine fiat. In the middle you have man, who is the microcosm, and the Latin word tibi, for you, which means we are the microcosm and that is God's gift to the world. We as men, as people, we rely on our five senses, but we also have knowledge of God, inner knowledge. The Corpus Hermeticum also says it. That is why man is the most gifted of creatures, because he has the use of his five senses, but also he has gnosis, he can achieve a knowledge of God. And that is what this image is also all about. Omnia ab uno, everything from the one. Omnia ad unum, everything returns in the one. Everything through the unity brings everything to the unity. So here you have the creator, you have the nature, and here you have the waves of life, and everything comes together in the microcosmos. The phenomenon of Western esotericism can be characterized by the fact that in most uh, historical periods it seems to be at odds with uh, mainstream religious thinking. And then later, especially starting with the scientific revolution and with the period of the Enlightenment, also with uh, scientific and rational thinking. The library is a telescope of visions of thousands of, of persons. But my life self, my inner life, is a microscope. Perhaps an author you might not expect to find on the shelves of this library, which is a hermetic, a chemical, magical library, is Spinoza. And, but he's here. Uh, this is an edition of one of his most famous works, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus. It, it's an amazing work in itself. It's also a very special edition. As you can see, it was supposedly printed in Hamburg but it wasn't printed in Hamburg at all. It was printed in Amsterdam. Amsterdam in the 17th century was a great city for freedom of expression, freedom of the press. Spinoza was very well aware of the fact that this was a very explosive work. It's in Latin. It's international, Latin being the lingua franca. And we have a letter from Spinoza to a friend of his, and he says, don't publish the work in Dutch because the, the ministers, you know, the preachers, are already up in arms against me. And if, if this work becomes available in Dutch, I will have no end of trouble. So the Dutch translation of the Tractatus was only published in 1693 when Spinoza was long dead. This kind of conflictual relationship should not be overemphasized in the sense that uh, in many cases you see that authors are trying to find a compromise. And if we move a little bit later to the 18th century, we encounter another very important phenomenon, which is modern Freemasonry. And that's very important because although we already see this model uh, earlier on, uh, with the beginning of Rosicrucianism, so the idea that in fact esotericists don't work alone, that in fact they should be organized in some sort of brotherhood, some sort of fraternity, kind of organization, but, uh, well, with Rosicrucianism, it's not clear whether this was just a project, something that was on paper, or whether such an organization really existed. Well, with Freemasonry, we have a real, concrete organization that is being created. So, the people getting together, engaging in all sorts of communal activities, in rituals, uh, and so on. We had 
famous visitors in the past, Umberto Eco, who is also a great collector of uh, hermetic and alchemical works. Last year we had Dan Brown, who was totally amazed by this collection because he has written so many novels about Rosicrucians, Freemasons, so he was bowled over by his visit to the library. One should not think that Freemasonry is esoteric per se, because Freemasonry, in fact, is a very complex phenomenon. And there are traditions in Freemasonry that are more open to esotericism, to spirituality, and other traditions that perhaps prefer to have a kind of more rational approach to spirituality. The microcosmos is a spark of the Big Bang, in the Big Bang, is the God's particle in creation. And I carry that God's particle as a treasure in my life. The library is so special because it's a private library, but it's open to the public. And it has on the shelves authors who wanted to unite people, bring them together, who didn't want division, who didn't want religious strife, who wanted people to acknowledge, to realize that they are a mirror of nature, that they are the microcosm, and that great hermetic sentence, as above, so below. Man is a mirror of light. He has a task of connection. So to, to receive that energy, the 18th century, of course, is also the age of the Enlightenment, which should be the age of rationality, insists on the importance of reason, the importance of science, sees at the same time the development of another esoteric current, which also makes a reference to the symbol of the light, which is called Illuminism. There is a direct energy floating throughout the universe, a simple example, light. Light in itself is invisible, but at the moment that it comes into contact with matter, it becomes color and becomes life. And we can say the sun is the origin of light, but light in itself of the sun is invisible. Illuminism lays great emphasis on the idea of mystical knowledge, based on mystical approach to nature and to the mysteries of the universe which is perhaps the kind of uh, flip side of the Enlightenment. My father decided he wanted to make his private collection uh, publicly accessible in 84. He had the vision to immediately say, okay, when we open up this collection, which is in fact a knowledge field, it should be accessed in a scholarly way. I built my library. I built the research institute. I was everywhere together with my staff in exhibitions. I, I published many books about this field. And now I want to come to a third point uh, that we say, let us share the future. We want to build a global hermetic circle of people who are generally interested. We started the project Hermetically Open to share every activity and aspect that we do with the collection in exhibitions and projects and the Ritman Institute and our publishing house in the Pelican. Simple, brief, clear, transparent, not to come with answers that people don't understand. Hermetically Open to All has in fact after a few years become our main strategy as a library because we have quite an elaborate scholarly context we have established over the years and we see that it's important that we open up all this knowledge, all this expertise to a broader audience and not only share our collection but also share our expertise in this way. I always saw the total field in front of me and then the books came, the field of magnetism, of energy, 
At the end of the 18th century, we have the current of animal magnetism with Franz Anton Mesmer. And another important current is Swedenborgianism, based on the teachings of the Swedish visionary and mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. These two currents combined, Swedenborgianism and animal magnetism, or mesmerism, as it is sometimes called, form a sort of backbone to all later esotericism. I went to all the different four corners of the world. It's all the same, but it comes together in one awareness. The East, the West, the North and the South, they will meet in a new consensus of questions. Where do I come from? why I am here, and what is the destiny of life. In the 19th century, we have spiritualism, which really begins in America. The classical date that is mentioned for the beginnings of this movement is 1848. The very basic idea that it is possible to have communication with the spirits of the dead, so that it is possible to talk to them, to receive messages from them, and therefore, to know about what is going to happen to us when we die. Most of the messages that are being received through spiritualism are in fact related to the destiny of man after death. The soul is the property of the microcosmos. The human presence is, I would say, a traveler in time and space. So I don't can tell you how many times I came here again and again. The transmigration of souls, I would give myself as an example. My soul comes back at the moment that I'm here again. We try to collect the first editions of, for instance, Madame Blavatsky's works. Spiritualism is not very much based on the idea of a tradition. It's more based on the idea of direct experience. You get together with a group of sympathetic persons and then you engage in what is usually called a science. With the help of a medium, so a person with particular skills, you enter in contact with the spirits of dead people. It is that simple, so you don't need to have a particular tradition for them. Occultism really begins around the same time as spiritualism, mid-19th century. There is a kind of hidden spiritual wisdom that has been handed down by a particular series of masters, of adepts, of initiates, that are going to keep alive the flame of this wisdom. In this sense, it is similar to older forms of esotericism. I warn everybody that it is not a way of speculation. It is very natural. And I can say this to you, a mystic, an, an hermetic uh, person, an alchemist, is far more concrete as the so-called mystics, alchemists, spiritists, occultists. They only produce clouds. And what I want to produce is an open air uh, that you see the sun. Huh? We wish your body that you see the reality, that you see the plants, the animals, that you see the people around you, and that you see them not so much as that they think that they are, but that you see them 
with the possibilities and that you inspire people, then I'm no longer a mystic, praying, sitting in an inner deep meditation. No, I walk in the street, I shake hands, I embrace people with the reality of my example. At the moment that you build a library, uh, it is an every day, every week, Every month, every year is an ongoing journey. After the First World War, you have a new current, perennialism or traditionalism. The main authors associated with this current are Frenchmen, uh, René Guénon, but then there are other important names, for instance, Sananda Kumaraswamy or the Italian Julius Evola. Now with traditionalism, we enter into a bit more pessimistic, late modern form of esotericism. Traditionalism is based, among other things, on the idea that in fact we are approaching the end of times. We should not trust so much the possibility to gain new knowledge from new discoveries of science, for instance, but that everything has to be related to a kind of primordial wisdom, an ancient wisdom. Everything that has created distance from this primordial tradition is intrinsically bad. So all modernity basically is bad. The library in the field of hermetic philosophy is for the first time brought together in the world. I wanted to be complete with this field. Complete. It took me about 50 years to be complete. And I can say we have an unbelievable richdom also in manuscripts and in incubables and also in modern prints. The fascination of, an, uh, of a collector is that a library is never really complete. After the Second World War, we have the emergence of other currents, for instance, neo-paganism, especially in the Anglo-American world, with the creation of particular groups like uh, Wicca, for instance, that is very important. But then we have, especially starting from the 60s, also other forms of esotericism that start to develop. For instance, the New Age. Now, the New Age has been perceived by observers, by scholars sometimes also, as a kind of popularized form of esotericism perhaps a commercial aspect. Some people think that it's a kind of uh, degeneration also of esotericism. You have the phenomenon of the bestseller, what are in fact esoteric ideas, but to a very, very large public. I love rare books because each one of them is different, whether it's the binding, the contents, someone has inscribed his thoughts in them. You share the ownership with the people who had these books in their hands, and gave it to the next generation. Owners have come and gone. Each rare book is different. It's a, a character of its own. It's not a library that went from hand to hand to hand, but the 30,000 books, they came from thousands of other owners, but they were always kept as a treasure. Look, look to the splendor of this book. Why I am always using giving firework at the end of the year to, to say every moment on, the, on New Year's Eve, the Big Bang comes back as a firework. Mm -hmm. 